Today I'm going to you know I'm going to talk about something that makes one of the things that makes Christianity so unique and special. You know, we have this certain sets of beliefs that we hold on to that makes us very different from the other people we love and care for that who holds a very different theological or faith persuasions. Um, for example, one of them is when it comes to salvation. When it comes to salvation, we could summarize their belief in how to be saved. Like almost every one of them, if not all of them, you could summarize it by the words doing. Doing, right? What you do. You got to do this. You got to do that. You should not do this. You should not do that. For Christians, it's summarized or it's, um, yeah, it's summarized by one word, done. Done. Our salvation is done. Jesus did it for us. It's not what we do. It's what Jesus did on the cross. We're not trying to. It's finished. That's the reason why those very famous words of the Lord Jesus on the cross. It is finished. The work of saving us is done. It's finished. So that's what makes us different. Um, it's, no, the gospel, though, if you look at the gospel and I present it, that's the reason why sometimes I use that as a, as a gauge or leverage on how wise a person is. Because I've met several Christians, even some of them were members of our church before, who would come to me and they're courting someone who's not a believer. So you already know that's not a word, of, that's not an act of wisdom there. But then they're trying to, they're trying to court someone. They really are in love with somebody who's also not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what I tell them is like, gauge the wisdom. Because if that person that you're interested with will not respond positively to something so great, so valuable, so important, and so clear, which is the gospel. That's the reason I tell them, present the gospel. Share the gospel. Because if they would not respond positively to something so important, something so clear, how do you think would they respond to you when you're debating or arguing or discussing with them about something way, way, way less more important than the gospel? Right? So you know there's going to be a lot of arguments that's going to go on because they're not wise enough to respond to the, to the simplest, honestly speaking, one of the simplest like salvation ways is the gospel. Okay, and one of the clearest way is the gospel. So if you, if you miss out on that one, what will, how will you understand the more complicated ones? Okay? So this is something that I, I, I say as an introduction to the message because although the gospel is an offense to many, although the gospel hurts people, although the gospel according to the, to the word of God is, is a sweet smelling savor to those that are being saved, but it is a stench of death or poison to those who are not, it is easy to understand. One of, the, one of the doctrines we have that is hard to understand, yes, people question salvation. Yes, people question the exclusivity of the Lord Jesus Christ being the only way to the Father and to get saved. But people somehow understand that. They just reject it for those who reject it, who don't like it. But there's a, there's a doctrine we have that we carry, that we bear, that's not easy to understand. In fact, even believers of that doctrine have a hard time understanding that belief. And what is that? The Trinity. So that's what I'm going to present to you today. Okay, today the title of the message is Demystifying or the Trinity Demystified. Because I'm going to try my very best. The one hour is not going to be enough or 30 minutes is, going to, is not going to be enough to demystify the Trinity. Because many people listening to me, probably here in this room or those online already have a preset idea sometimes when you have something you're predisposed to something you're locked into that kind of belief system that even if, if even if somebody's explaining something to you what's caught in your mind is what you believe in that it's so hard to change it although what you're hearing is something so clear so we're going to try to attempt and i pray that the lord will use my humble attempt to explain at least the the overarching truths about the Trinity. And then, again, for more details, we're going to have two parts on this one. For more details, please come. We are, we're actually right now studying on our Bible study on Wednesday, um, 
the foundation, the foundational Christian beliefs where you could actually ask questions and have an interchange of opinion and ideas and uh, all of those to help each other. Okay, so I'm inviting you for that one. But we'll try to accomplish something in our message today as well. Okay, Genesis 1.26 says something that probably will be the first appearance or indicator or implication of the reality of the Trinity. Genesis 1.26, the very first chapter of the very first book of the Bible in the New International Version says these words. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Okay? So now I'm going to talk about the Trinity, which is throughout the course of history, especially denominations have risen, that, that it is one of the major doctrines of beliefs of Christianity that we consider as orthodox and indisputable, non-negotiable. Now I know of at least one person in our generation who believe that it is not, Indisputable, it is something that's, that could be considered as disputable because even Christians don't understand it. Even Christians don't understand it and even Christians don't explain it the same way. And even Christians really have a hard time explaining it. That's the reason why he said, if, if, if many Christians miss out on the actual doctrine of the Trinity, don't tell me that they are lost. So, um, so I would leave that to you. I just want to let you know that there is at least one person I know who believe that this could. He's not adamant about it. And we're not going to rock the boat today regarding that. We're going to concentrate on the orthodox belief regarding this as if it is indeed an indisputable belief in Christendom. Okay, so we're going to talk about the concept of Trinity. So what is the meaning of Trinity? The first thing I'd like to talk about is what it is not. Okay, what it is not. It's not three persons and three gods. It's not three persons and three gods. Otherwise, they'll be called polytheism. We are not polytheists. Poly meaning many, theists or the theos meaning God. It's not polytheism. There are a lot of religious persuasions in the world that believe in that. Okay, like uh, I'll mention to you, example one, faith persuasions who love them, but they believe that there are that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are three distinct beings, but they're also three different gods, okay? So they believe in three gods. Who are they? The Mormons, okay? The Mormons. Mormonism believes that. Mormonism believes that. So the second thing about what it's not is this. It is not three manifestations of one God. Okay, everybody say manifestation. So what are you talking about, pastor, right? Some of you probably have that in your mind. What are you talking about, pastor? So this is like more of a transformer, God. Okay, this is what the oneness believers believe in. So when you see United Pentecostal Church, for example, you see that? Well, the Methodists, when you use the word united, this is not what it means. But United Pentecostal, when you see that, for example, it believes in a oneness belief, meaning to say there's only one God, the Father, and he manifested, appeared, showed, transforms himself into Jesus, the Son of God. And then Jesus goes up to heaven and transforms himself to the Holy Spirit. One person, one God. You got it? So the first one we had was polytheism. Okay, so which is three persons, three gods. The second one is one person, one God. Three different manifestations or forms. Okay, the third one, which is what it is, it is not, is it's not three distinct persons with only one of those persons being God. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are three distinct persons. Well, in fact, they emphasize on the distinction. They're so distinct, but only the Father is God. So even if we admit that the Son of God is God, it will be under the category of small g's. 
small g, small letter g. And again, we love them, but the faith persuasion that's known for this, we got a lot in the Philippines, Iglesia and Cristo group, uh, Church of Christ translated. Not the Church of Christ that we have here, that we know here, but the one that originated in the Philippines. But we also have the Jehovah's Witnesses. The Jehovah's Witnesses believe that, yes, Jesus may even be divine, but uh, he's a small g. Okay? But if you talk about the ultimate power like Zeus, you know, in the Greek mythology, the ultimate God, although again, Greek mythology is polytheism. So then that will be what Jehovah's Witnesses believe in. Okay, so the meaning, those are not what we believe in. So what do we believe about the three persons in one God? Okay, it is monotheistic, number one. Everybody say monotheism. Mono means one, not poly, many. Okay, monotheism, theos, God. So we believe in one God. We believe in one God. Okay, anyone who says, because there are people, for example, people we love, the Muslims, okay, they believe that we believe in three gods. Okay, they believe that we're polytheists. So anyone, anyone though, anyone who tells us that we believe in three gods or that we're polytheists, do not understand what Trinity is. Okay? So the first one is it is monotheistic. The second one is that it is a belief in three distinct persons in one God. Okay, three distinct persons in one God. We believe in God in three persons. God in three persons. Blessed Trinity. <laughs> okay, I <laughs> got out of two. <laughs> All right. God in three persons, blessed Trinity. So we know the terms, it's just the understanding of it that gives us a hard time. So we got the Father, the first person of the Trinity, the Son, the second person of the Trinity, and then the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, three distinct persons, three distinct entities, or three distinct beings, but each constitute each other in one God. Okay? God consists of three persons, all three persons, each person is God. Each person is a part of the Godhead. That Godhead is that one God. Okay? So I'm getting more confused, Pastor. Okay, so hang in there. Hang in there, all right? So we're going to look at the Bible revelations first regarding this. Okay, Bible revelation. The first one we looked at the meaning. We're going to take a look at the Bible revelation. The Bible explicitly, when it comes to one God, there's no problem understanding that. A lot of people, a lot of persuasions who don't agree with us in the Trinity believe in one God. Always remember that. So, But the Bible is explicit about it as well. It's like direct statements from the Bible. I'm going to do a lot of passages regarding that. Not all the passages that I have, but a lot of the passages I'm going to read to you. Um, let me, I'll, I'll determine when I'm going to stop. Okay. So Isaiah 43.10. Almost everything is from the International Version. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord. In fact, this verse I'm reading to you right now is the, one of the main verses that Jehovah's Witnesses use. Okay? This one right here. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am He. Before me, no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. Okay? So that means to say there's one God. Very clear about it. There's no other God but Him. Nobody, is, nobody was formed before Him. Nobody will be formed after Him. There's not going to be an additional God. Okay, Isaiah 44, 6 and 8. This is what the Lord says. Israel's King and Redeemer. The Lord Almighty. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. Do not tremble. Do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. It's like there's, there's no, it's, it's, it's right away if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll get excited about that verse. You know, because right there in this verse, Isaiah was declaring and God was speaking. It was talking about there's no other gods before me. There's no other God but me. I am the first. And the last. It's like, didn't I hear that before? Who said that? Right? So, so our hearts get excited. Like they jump. Like, 
Ooh, that's a statement from Jesus. You know, and, and God was saying there's no other gods but me. But then he said something exactly like a title for himself that applied to our Lord Jesus as well. Okay, let me jump on. Um, 46 verse 9, according to Isaiah 46, again, it says, Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Okay, in the New Testament, John 17, 3, Jesus speaking, Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. 1 Corinthians 8, 5, and 6, For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods. Okay, you see that? Um, Quote-unquote gods and many lords, quote-unquote. Yet for us there is but one God. A father from, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. Okay, we're not going to dissect that uh, verse. But this very interesting verse showing the distinction of the father and the son. But it comes very close to each other. Okay, so we're just showing to you. Again, my point is not to, to dissect that um, and show the differences yet. But to show you that the Bible is very explicit, it's very straightforward when it comes to like declaring that there is only one God, the Bible is clear, indisputable. There's only one God. But the Bible also is implicit about the three persons. Okay? It's not explicit, but it's implicit. It implies, it shows it to us that there are what we call, there's something called the Trinity, although the Trinity word is not found in the Bible. Okay, remember, people who attack your belief system a lot of times will tell you that it's not in the Bible. Okay, but we've already, sta we've already stated that before, that just because something is not in the Bible does not mean the truth is not in the Bible. Remember that? The word omniscient, omnipresent, um, and omnipotent, are those true about God? But all those words are not found in the Bible. Okay? Remember, the most interesting thing is the word Bible is not found in the Bible. <laughs> but we believe it. So if it's, not, it's not a legitimate attack or polemic okay, against Christianity. Okay? So um, the first thing that you'd notice, I'm going to read to you some of the verses where it actually implies the presence of the Trinity. Very familiar. Some of them are very familiar to many of us. Matthew 28, 19. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name, singular, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Okay? 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 6. So you saw the Father there. Okay, do you remember? We're not dissecting this deep. In a deep study, that'll be on a Wednesday or Tuesday. But we're going through this, okay, just to show you that, yes, it was one God declared explicitly, and then we've got Trinity implied in the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 6. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God. Works all of them in all men. Okay, 2 Corinthians 13 verse 14. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Okay, so but by the way, when I'm reading these things, it doesn't, mean, it doesn't actually show any significance to us. But what I've learned, I don't know how true this is. I've not done a deep research on this one. But what I've learned when I was in the Bible school was that it was not customary... And it was something very critical when you actually put names side by side with each other. Especially when you put a name side by side with God. Because doing so is almost giving them an equal footing. So every time you see these words where God, Jesus, Lord, Holy Spirit are put together, it, is, it may be way deeper than what we think it is. As a superficial surface reading of it. Okay? So it's almost like probably a statement that, yes, I'm putting them on equal footing with each other. Okay, so 
1 uh, Peter 1, 2. It says, who have, chosen, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God, and God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and sprinkling by His blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. And then Jude 1, 20 to 21. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith, and pray in the Holy Spirit, Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Okay, so at least we accomplished something this morning that I wanted to accomplish or, uh, or touch on. We have a lot more materials the next um, time I preach about it. And again, a lot more materials on our, in our Bible studies, especially if you have questions right now. But one thing we've established, and I want you to put this in your mind, is that yes, we believe there's one God, and then we also believe that the Bible declare or somehow implicitly shows us the Trinity or the truth about the Trinity. So the question that I asked while I was preparing this is this. Like, Lord, what's our takeaway in this? What is our takeaway in this? And my mind was brought to when I was trying to like look at all the illustrations that I've heard and I've learned and I've come up with. And, and how I see some of Christian's illustrations. I, there's one illustration about the Trinity that I looked at, and it was like very intellectually put together, but I was uh, humbly, I state that I see error right away. Like, it's this, this is coming from very intellectual people, but we miss it. Some people miss it. So I said, Lord, so what, what's our takeaway? One of the things that I, that I have come up with when it comes to like the illustration about the Trinity is that one of the best illustrations, but still flawed, okay, it's not complete, is you and me. You and me. In the sense that when God says, in the beginning we read that word, that God created you and me in His image. Now that's, that image there is defined so many different ways and interpreted so many different ways because the Bible is not straightforward as to what that image is. We know that God doesn't have a physical form, so it may not be physical. and We don't look like, or else God is going to look like so many other with so many other faces, right? It's not physical because the Bible tells us it has no form. So, but when it talks about being created in God's image, I saw like this is a good illustration for Trinity, which is it's still again lacking, not exactly parallel to each other, but comes very close to home. Like last Wednesday, I was telling everybody, if you get confused right now, when you know we're gonna stop our study, but it's possible to have three in one. So don't ever think that it's not possible that we could have three in one. And I told everybody, if you drink coffee with cream and sugar, that's three in one. Okay, so you already have that there. Three separate things, coffee, sugar, and milk or cream. But in one instant, they could all be together in this coffee you're drinking. You're not, when you drink that, you don't say, I'm drinking coffee, cream, and sugar. You're drinking coffee. Right? You got everything there. So, but, but one thing that I believe is more theological in, in, in application or illustration is you and me being created in God's image because you and I have three parts in each one of us. The body, the soul, and the spirit. Right? Body, the soul, and the spirit. Of all these three, there's only one that you see. The body. Colossians 2.9 tells us that Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In the Godhead, you're not going to see anybody else except Jesus. Every time you see, every time you see God in a body, uh, what I mean to say is in a bodily form. Every time you want to see God in a bodily form, it will be Jesus. Okay? So I said, okay, what is this? What is it? What can I, what can we take know more about this thing and this, uh, there's so many things I could go to when it comes to the application of this but I said okay since since it's talking about him being created in his image the first thing I'd like to encourage everybody is this okay, God as I said even in the best and the greatest illustration we have is still flawed we're always going to lack we're always going to fall short when it comes to God just because it is hard doesn't mean it's not true I admit the doctrine of the Trinity for some of us is not easy to understand. But just because it's not easy, that we, 
we join others in creating an understandable God. My challenge to you is whether you understand it fully or not, is to keep on growing in our knowledge of God. Keep on growing in the knowledge of God because there will never come a time, and God knows about this. He sets His standard very high. Be ye perfect, for your Father in heaven is perfect. He also tells us in the Word of God that we're not going to be perfect permanently. Right? Like Him. Even in our perfection, it's not going to be as perfect as He is. Okay? We're all going to fall short of His glory every time. But my challenge is, is because there's so many cults, thousands and thousands of cults have been formed because of the lack of understanding of this Trinity. And for them to understand it, for them to actually know it, they change what the Bible teaches and they start worshiping and creating a different God. So my challenge for us is, whether we understand it or not, we worship the one true God. Don't create it. Don't deviate from it. Worship the one true God. But I challenge each one of us, know Him more. Spend more time with Him and spend more time. How do we know God? Spend more time with Him and spend more time with His Word. That's where we get to know our God, okay? And just find rest in the truth that we can never really know God fully. Okay, but I'm okay with that. And that's very important. It's very important. Can I, can I share to you? Like, I know of a person who's so intelligent, so smart, but whenever I talk to him about the gospel and being more serious about it, he just comes up with a lot more questions. And his passion is that before he gives his life over, because before he fully or totally commits his life to Jesus, he wants all of his questions answered. And I told him, you know what? That's not, our, that's not God's call for us. Because we are not omniscient beings. We don't know it all. And we will never know it all. We will always have questions that are unanswered. But my encouragement for you and for him was, with all the answers you've gathered, make a decision. With all the answers, albeit incomplete, that you have gathered, which one is the most reasonable? Which one is the most plausible? Which one is the most believable? Which one makes the most sense? I tell you, and I challenge you to challenge me in this, the Christian faith and dogma is the most reasonable of all errors that you're going to read. It answers justice. It actually presents love. What persuasion started with a founder saying, I came to die? What persuasion started with saying, I came, left the glories of heaven, came down to this earth, to this earth mud, to give my life for the salvation in the sense of people who don't care about me. What faith persuasion started with that? Did anybody come up? Did he just come up with that? Who would come up with that anyway, right? I want to start a religion. I'm going to die for this religion. And how, while I'm dying for them, they're going to beat me up, you know? Nothing could present to us the love of God and the justice of God together except the gospel. That's where you find it. The cross shows us the love of God. But it also shows the justice of God. We never got away with it because somebody paid for us. Okay? So the next thing I'd like us to focus on in relation to the Trinity. Okay? It's talking about oneness and it's also talking about differences. So my encouragement to each one of us is this. Because in that oneness, by the way, do you realize, do you realize that the Trinity proves the love of God? How did you say that, Pastor? Indirectly, implicitly. Do you know that love, remember I told you, I forgot already the verbatim of this, but a song is not a song until you sing it. A bell is not a bell until you ring it. Love wasn't put in the heart to stay. For love is not love until you give it away. If there was no trinity, there was no giving away of love. 
If there was only one, who are you going to give that love to? How are you going to express that love to? But because the Bible tells us that God is love, there's got to be a way for that love to operate, right? And that operated within the Trinity. That's why you look at the Holy Spirit, you look at God the Father, you look at the Lord Jesus Christ, you see a perfect love going on among them. And that's the challenge that I have for us today. The unity of the believers. The unity of the body of Christ. The first thing I'd like to do, but before I go there, I want us to look at the oneness first. Okay? This is the one that, that, I, that I discussed first, okay? Let's celebrate, oh, no, no, I mean the uniqueness. The uniqueness. Let's celebrate our uniqueness. Let's celebrate our differences. Can we do that? We all have differences. The world is replete with differences. We are surrounded with differences. Okay? We have different colors. We have different races. We have different status in life. We have different features. We have different heights. We have different genders. We, we are surrounded. We have different ways of doing things. But instead, what happens to the world, the way the world reacts to it is, because of this difference, even in a relationship as close to the relationship of Jesus and the church, even in a relationship between husband and wife, what happens is the relationship gets distorted or broken and hurt and devastated and destroyed because, because we don't know or people don't know how to handle differences. As believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we handle the things differently. We look at differences and we don't look at each other as if I'm better than you are. And I condemn you for being different. I'm more beautiful than you are. I got taller nose or higher nose, narrower nose. You got broad nose. You're ugly. I'm pretty. Who defined that anyway? Can I, can I, can, can I, can I humble you a little bit? Do you know the husband of that girl you're saying she's ugly? The husband courted her, not you. For him, she's pretty, you're not. Isn't that being real? Being real. We don't look down on each other. We don't judge each other just because they're very different. We celebrate each other's uniqueness. Um, we've got good, godly reactions to these things. We don't treat each other with contempt. We love each other. We celebrate each other. Like what we say in the very beginning of our message, before we give our message. What do we say? In essentials, we have unity. In non-essentials, we have liberty. In all things, we have charity. We have love. If, if the differences is not sinful or immoral or anti, I would say anti-biblical, let them be. Because God created them as a different person. Ada has a very different personality than I do. She has a very different ministry than I have. But you know what? My, my niece was leaving. They live in my house. They stayed here. They, Ate Marlene was on vacation. Hannah was on vacation for several days. But before they left, they wanted prayer. And guess what? I was in the house. But who do they want to pray for them? Ada. Ada. But she said, work. She's not out until 2. Oh, we'll wait for her. Because that's her ministry. I love the way she prays. I may be different in my giftings, but she has a gift that I don't have. You got a gift that I don't have. I may be standing right here, but you got so much things that you could do that I can't do. That's why we appreciate each other. Amen. That's why we love each other. Amen. That's why we value each other. Isn't that right? Because we celebrate each other's uniqueness. So please don't look down on yourself as well. I can't do what he does. I can't jump the way he jumps. Right? Don't feel so bad if the Lakers ousted you from the... 
play, what do you call this thing? Play, what? Play off. Playoffs. Playoff, right? It sounded wrong, right? Don't, don't get discouraged if the Lakers, that was their gift. That was Lakers' gift. They were more gifted than your team during that time. But Lakers and Lakers fans don't feel bad that the Nuggets eliminated them. It just so happens that the Nuggets are more gifted than they were probably. We all have, but, but the Lakers for several months had the gift of giving joy to our guys in the church. Well, they were winning. We need each other, right? I am a very, very organized person. I need a balance, so I have my wife. Uh, she's organized too. You know what I'm talking about? We let, we let our differences, instead of our differences separating us and causing us to fight and causing us to to have a heartache and, and bad days we we'll let our difference strengthen us complete us complement us that's who we are listen carefully you're different from me my ways of doing things are different from you and your ways of doing things are different from me but i will sell it we celebrate each other in the body of christ isn't that right we celebrate each other. Amen. Okay. We're not trying to turn each other into ours. Like we're not trying to turn. I'm not trying to turn you into me. You're not trying to turn me into you. We're all turning each other into the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay. So let's celebrate our differences. And also let's celebrate our oneness. Okay. There are many areas of unity in our lives. This is very important. There are many areas of unity in our lives. We have one, like we have one marriage. And I pray it stays that way. We have one marriage. We have one family. There's, many of you may feel comfortable visiting a friend's family, but you're still, you're still a part of one family. You're a biological family. We have a spiritual family. You're a part of, you're, you're a part of FCF. You're a part of one country. You're part of one world, one earth. You're part of one human race. There's so many things that unite us all together. But honestly speaking, in the world today, there are so many things that threaten our oneness. Why is it that it finds it necessary for the Lord to say, Till death do you part. Let no man put asunder. Why was it necessary for our Lord Jesus to point that out? Because there are many people in our society today, the basic unit of relationship in society is the husband and wife and the family. But there are so many factors and forces in our society today that are destroying that oneness of a husband and wife and are destroying the oneness of a family. There are many forces that are destroying the oneness of the church. A lot of churches that are divided. A lot of churches have closed their doors. There are a lot of churches who are being weak because it's being destroyed. There are a lot of forces destroying this country, our country. Do you know that America is so divided today? Look at the votes. The vote is almost even, split, middle, 51%, 49%, or 58%. 52%. It's like, that's divided. We are a powerful, strong country for one. But the beautiful thing about believers is that we believe in what Jesus says to us. We are loyal to this country. We love this country. And not only this country, but you're being so like patriotic that you hate everybody. No, we love this country and we also love the world. We love all the other countries. But we're not going to hate on our country just to love the world. We love the world. And we love what consists of the human world. What is that? We love you as human beings. Just because you're black, brown, rich, poor, girl, boy, 
we're gonna, that we're going to hate on you. We love you because we're one human race. If you're a human being, I love you. We're one. Amen? If you don't believe our unity, just have an alien invade us. We're going to be one all together, fighting that alien. But, hey, you believe in aliens, Pastor? I'm like, we're not that. I'm just, just an example. Are you following me? So let's strengthen our bond and try to stand up against everything and everyone. Let's push for, let's always push for peace and unity. Any attitude, any action, any position, anything that you have in your mind to do that will cause the vision, you know it's not from God. Push for unity. Push for oneness. That's who we are. That's who we are created from. In the image of God, created He Him. Male and female, created He them. You were created in God's image. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let me end with this. The oneness of God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the love of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit is displayed, I think, greatest in the act of salvation. With the Father in His delight to save the people, sent His only begotten Son who willingly sacrificed His life for you and me. And the moment we place our trust in the Lord Jesus as Lord and Savior, the Spirit of God comes into you, comes into me, and He quickens our spirit and makes us alive, having this eternally regenerated spirit, possessing the gift of eternal life. If you haven't yet received the most beautiful consequence of that love relationship and the oneness of the triune God which is the salvation of you and me the gift of salvation and if you want to receive it today we're going to lead you in a simple prayer if you pray this prayer if you desire if you want to be reconnected with God and you want to get saved we're going to pray a simple prayer but in this prayer the position of your heart ought to be that you are placing your full dependence on Jesus for your salvation. Because yes, the entire Godhead worked for this. You're placing your entire life to Jesus for your salvation. And you're also giving Him over the driver's seat of your life. Him being the Lord of your life. Humbly asking for your forgiveness. Knowing and understanding that your sins have separated, or our sins have separated us from God. But we want to be back home. Okay, so if you want this from in, in, in your life, you want that free gift of salvation, courtesy of the Trinity, then let's pray this prayer. And those of you who have prayed this before, support those doing this for the first time. And let's welcome them into the family. Okay? Dear God in heaven, thank you for this day that you've shown me the unity and the oneness of who you are. Thank you because you were one. And deciding to save me. And in acting towards it. Lord, I know I need that salvation. I want that salvation. I open my heart to you. Admitting that I've sinned against you. But I accept you now. As my Savior. And my Lord. Forgive me of all my sins. From now on, I will follow you. In Jesus' name. Everybody say amen and give the Lord a big round of praise. Again, welcoming you all those who did make that decision to receive Jesus Christ today. Whether you're here in the sanctuary or you're there watching us through the internet. If you did make a decision to receive the Lord Jesus Christ in your life as Lord and Savior and receive that free gift of salvation. We like to say according to John 1, 12, from the Word of God, you receive Him. He has given you the right to become a child of God. So we like to say welcome to the family of God. This is the eternal family you're a part of now. So let us know of your decision so that we can journey with you in this beautiful, beautiful life that you have found in Christ. God bless you. May I request everybody to please stand. Now we're going to pray. Uh, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're still going to ask the prayer, prayer team to come up, but we're going to give the benediction right now and the prayer team to come up right after that and, and if you have a prayer need and 
if you have a rift in your family, a rift in your marriage, and if you want God to mend that and make you one, um, to work better for oneness in your family, whatever, in your workplace, whatever it may be, and, and you need prayer for that, God is on your side because you're on His side on that one. Okay, everybody just go ahead. We're going to close in this bless, just blessing God. And now unto Him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Everybody say, Amen, amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for coming today. We appreciate you. We really, really love seeing you every Sunday. God bless you. And have a good day. Have a good weekend. Till we see each other again. God bless.